Hi everyone, welcome to your lecture on the biological basis of behavior. Today we're going to look at the nervous system and the endocrine system. The nervous system is the high speed connections within your body that give you instantaneous feedback. The endocrine system is better known as your hormonal system. And this is going to be a system equally as important, but it takes a little bit more time for us to become aware of. Neurons are the building blocks of your nervous system. You have two different systems, your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is going to include your brain and your spinal cord, while your peripheral nervous system will include all of the other motor and sensory nerves throughout your body. This doesn't mean that your brain and spinal cord don't have nerves or neurons, they do. The two major divisions, like I said, your central nervous system that runs down the center of your body, hence the name, that includes the brain and the spinal column. The peripheral nervous system, all of the nerves to the periphery of your body or to the outside. This includes your motor nerves, which tells your muscles to contract or move, and your sensory nerves, which brings information to your brain, letting it know what it's feeling, touching, sensing. A basic neuron or nerve cell has three important tasks to perform. First, it must receive information from neurons that feed into it. Second, it carries that information down the length of its cell body. And finally, it passes that information off to the next neuron in line. This chain reaction of receiving, interpreting, and passing along allows you to perform every single task that you have ever performed in your entire life. It's important for you guys to know not only the structures that are part of a neuron, but what they do. The first structure that we'll talk about is the dendrite. Dendrites are the branches that extend from the cell body. In this picture, they're the purpley colored branches coming off of the red center. Dendrites receive information from other cells in the form of neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters dock at the dendrite and then are later released. The docking at the dendrite causes an impulse to be sent towards the cell body. The cell body is also known as your soma. This contains the nucleus and all the other kind of machinery or hardware necessary to maintain the health of the neuron but it also generates what we'd call a threshold. When enough information comes from the dendrites to the cell body, the cell body can actually start an electrical signal in the axon. The axon is this long extension coming off of the cell body. It ends at the terminal buttons. So here in the picture, you see a nice little triangle, but the end part actually doesn't encapsulate all of the axon. It goes all the way to that area called the terminal ends. The axon, will generate what's known as an action potential, an electrical impulse. It also, at the very end in those terminal buttons, houses neurotransmitters, messengers that it can send on to other cells. The axon terminals are the endpoints of the neuron, and this is where those neurotransmitters are stored. And again, neurotransmitters are small chemical messengers. So looking at a nerve cell, the dendrite end receives chemical signals neurotransmitters, that it sends information from that to the cell body. The axon generates an electrical signal that travels all the way down its body. And when that electrical signal gets to the very end of the terminal button, it can actually shove or push out new neurotransmitters, again, chemical signals. This is why we call neural firing an electrochemical response. To speed up some of that firing, some cells are covered in what's known as myelin sheath. Myelin sheath is like a fatty tissue that surrounds the axons. The easiest way to understand why this would happen is to think about why you might put a plastic coating around a wire for, say, an electrical cord. It keeps the message of the electricity from dissipating. It keeps it highly concentrated and it makes the message go faster. Dominoes are a really good way of describing the three stages of neural firing. The first stage is the setup. The second stage is the action, and the third stage is the reset. Resting potential, action potential, and refractory period are the three different stages in neural firing. Resting potential is when the neuron could fire, but it hasn't received any kind of stimulation from the outside world, or it hasn't gotten any information from a surrounding nerve cell. In other words, like that domino that's set up, ready to be knocked over, it has the potential to do something, it's just waiting for something to impact it. Action potential is literally the electrical charge that is generated in the axon of that nerve cell. It's the neural impulse. 
So when a dendrite sends enough stimulus to the cell body, the cell body will initiate an action potential in that nerve cell. It'll generate an electrical charge in the axon. That electrical charge will travel down the entire length of the axon and end at the axon terminal. Terminal meaning to end. When it gets to the axon terminal, the electrical charge will actually push against neurotransmitters, causing them to spill out into an area that we call the synapse, or a gap. Those neurotransmitters will then impact another nerve cell and then return home to that original nerve cell that they fired from. The refractory period is the recharging phase. Once the action potential has been sent, the cell needs to reset itself and it needs to collect the neurotransmitters that it had just sent out to that other cell to continue its message. While neurotransmitters are returning home and while the internal state of the cell is resetting itself, the cell cannot fire again. It's in its refractory period. Basically, it's like resetting up those dominoes. Neural firing is dictated by a principle called the all or nothing principle. It basically states that when a neuron fires, and we're talking about the action potential, the electrical charge in the axon, it fires at the same intensity. And it will either fire completely or it won't fire at all. Action potentials are always the same strength. So a good way to kind of think about this is to think about if you've ever fired a paintball gun or a Nerf gun. If you've ever fired a paintball gun, if you pull the trigger back nice and slowly, the paintball isn't going to trickle out of the gun. And if you pull it back fast, the paintball isn't going to get extra velocity and come out faster. Once you trip the mechanism that allows everything to go into action, it happens the same way every single time. So when we're talking about an action potential, it either happens or it doesn't. But as long as the mechanism is triggered to start that electrical signal, it will travel at the same intensity every single time. I mentioned earlier synapses. A synapse is a small fluid filled gap between two different nerve cells, from the axon terminal of one to the dendrite end of another. Nerve cells never touch. They get microscopically close, close enough for neurotransmitters to float through this liquidy gap and reliably meet up at the next neuron. Neurotransmitters are chemicals, dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, and a couple others that we'll talk about. They fit like a key into a lock. They will actually leave from the terminal end of an axon, float across the synapse, and unlock a message on the dendrite end of the next cell. They literally fit like a key goes into a lock. Now here's the thing that I always tell students. You never leave your key in your lock. You always take it back home. So the neurotransmitters don't get absorbed into the next cell. They get released from the dendrite end and they go back home to the terminal buttons in the axon that they came from. Neurotransmitters are housed in the axon terminal buttons. Reuptake is when they are released from the dendrites where they try to send their message and they're reabsorbed back into those terminal buttons. This happens during the refractory period when the dominoes are being reset and when the cell is trying to get back to its original state. It's hard to imagine a lot of these things without seeing a picture. So here we go. You should see a white arrow and it says action potential. Well, that action potential is an electrical charge. Those balls that you see, they're vesicles and they contain neurotransmitters. So if they contain neurotransmitters, we know that we're looking at the axon terminal button, the end of the axon. That action potential is going to push those balls filled with neurotransmitters into the cell wall. When they hit the cell wall, it's actually going to permeate or rupture, and it will allow neurotransmitters to fill into that space. That space is your synaptic gap. It's a fluid-filled space that allows neurotransmitters to pass from the axon down to the dendrite. On the dendrite side, you see things called receptor sites. These are the locks. No message is getting to the cell body unless those locks can be opened. And the neurotransmitters technically are the keys. They will dock at a receptor site and provide stimulation to the cell body. And once that happens, 
those neurotransmitters are released from the receptor site and they go back home to the axon end of the cell that sent them. They go back into those vesicles, they go back into the axon. The image that you see here is represented in your textbook, but let's just talk through it really quickly. What you're seeing here is a sending neuron and a receiving neuron. The sending neuron has an action potential that has been generated, an electrical charge. As that electrical charge travels down the axon, it eventually arrives at the terminal buttons, what you see here in the lower left-hand corner. That electrical charge is pushing the vesicles into the cell wall of the axon terminal. And once they hit the cell wall, the cell wall ruptures and the neurotransmitters spill out. Those neurotransmitters dock at the receptor sites on the dendrite end of the receiving neuron. They are going to excite or inhibit, send a message or prevent a message from being sent to the next cell. The receiving neuron is gonna take that information and pass it along to the cell body. While that's happening, those neurotransmitters that docked at the receptor sites are being released. They're gonna travel back over the synapse, that fluid filled space, and be reabsorbed through the process of reuptake, as you see in the upper right hand corner, back into the sending axon, the terminal end of that sending axon. They'll be reabsorbed into vesicles and everything will reset so that that cell can fire again. I've told you a couple of times that neurotransmitters act like keys. The lock is going to be on the dendrite end of any nerve cell. So neurotransmitters can rest in very specific receptor sites on those dendrites. And in fact, they're a specific shape that will only work with very specific receptor sites. In other words, like a lock and a key, neurotransmitters can only unlock certain messages. Once in a receptor site, they can give you two different messages, excitory or what we'd call inhibitory. Now the easiest way to explain why we might want to excite or inhibit comes with hunger. There has to be a communication system in the brain that makes you feel hungry and then one that makes you stop feeling hungry. So we'll send specific neurotransmitters to excite that hunger response and then we'll send very specific neurotransmitters to shut that response down and hopefully get you to stop eating. So it is important in the human body to have some messages that get a message kind of excited and going and one that slows that message down and maybe even stops it. You would never want to never feel full. That would be a horrible thing. Like I told you before, neurotransmitters fit into receptor sites like a key fits into a lock. There are a couple of specific neurotransmitters that you guys need to know. I'd love to give you some really clever ways to remember these, but the truth is this is where you probably want to bust out some flashcards and just memorize. The first one is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that works in the central nervous system and it affects learning, memory, and muscle contractions. This is the neurotransmitter that is most closely associated with Alzheimer's disease. People with Alzheimer's disease have a low production or are no longer producing acetylcholine. This often leads to first the memory loss, but later something we don't often think about associated with Alzheimer's disease, which is that the muscle contractions in that person's body stops functioning. They eventually become bedridden due to Alzheimer's disease. Dopamine is another neurotransmitter that you guys want to know. This one affects learning, attention, emotion, motivation. Too much dopamine is actually associated with schizophrenia, specifically the hallucinations that people often experience in schizophrenia. But dopamine is also lacking in kids who have ADHD. They don't have that motivation or that attention neurotransmitter that makes them crave their focus. So it's really important for really anything that we determine to be essential or necessary. Dopamine lets us know that. Serotonin is essentially what we'll call our mood neurotransmitter. It does affect hunger, sleep, and arousal, but it's most notable that low levels of serotonin are often experienced in people with depression. There are drugs that can either mimic or block neurotransmitters. Antagonist and agonist are the two classifications. It's important to note that the body doesn't produce these. Neurotransmitters the body naturally produces. These are gonna be any kind of drug that you take into your system. An antagonist is a drug that blocks the effect of a neurotransmitter. It in fact occupies the receptor site just enough that the neurotransmitter can't do anything. 
An agonist is a mimic. It's just similar enough to a neurotransmitter that if the body isn't producing enough of it, this might get the cells to send the same message that the neurotransmitter might have once sent. So I told you guys, too much dopamine causes schizophrenia. Well, one of the treatments for schizophrenia would be a, to take a drug that prevents that excess dopamine from stimulating the dendrite ends of the cell, block the receptor sites. Serotonin is often low in people who have depression. So we may want to prescribe to somebody a drug that mimics serotonin because if their body isn't producing enough, this may actually help alleviate their depression. Again, an antagonist blocks a neurotransmitter. So in this case, you have something that's similar enough to the actual neurotransmitter that it will fit into the receptor site, but not similar enough that it'll actually send the message. That's different than an agonist. An agonist is enough of a mimic that it'll fit the receptor site, but even more so that it'll continue the message that the original neurotransmitter would have sent. We've talked about neural firing, and that neural firing occurs in the spinal column, in the brain, and it also occurs in your peripheral nervous system. Your reflex arc is your most basic neural communication. If you've ever gone to a sports physical and had them hit your knee and your leg kicked out, or if you've ever hit your funny bone, you know what your reflex arc is. It's a three-step process. Step one, you get some kind of information from your environment literally uh, a sense, a cell in the body that detects one or four types of energies. These are going to be your receptor cells. In other words, you don't obviously have exposed nerve cells on the outside of your body. You have receptor cells and your skin is full of receptor cells for pressure, for temperature, for pain. Those specialized cells will take pressure and turn it into a neural impulse. Step two, that information needs to get to your brain. So it has to travel through some major highways to get to your central nervous system. Those sensory nerves are gonna take in that sensory information. So think about it this way. You're walking in the grass and you start to put your foot down and you sense something sharp and pointed at the base of your foot. That information, that sharp sensation at the base of your foot needs to travel from your skin that's having the pressure applied to it and maybe even a little bit of pain that needs to be transferred into code that the brain can read, so electrical chemical impulse. It needs to travel up some pretty long nerve cells to include your femoral nerve, which is about three feet long, and finally get to your spinal column, the start of your central nervous system. Your central nervous system will then, through a series of what are called interneurons, determine what action should happen. Should the information continue on to the brain, or is it really important for the body to react? Well, if you're about to step on a piece of glass or a nail, like in this scenario, it's probably really important for your body to react before your brain even perceives what's happening. So interneurons in the spinal column are going to generate another action potential with motor neurons. And it's gonna tell you to maybe squeeze your quadricep and pull your leg away. It goes from sense to interpretation to motion. So I already told you step three, which is the motor neurons then cause you to react. It's important to note that your sensory neurons are also sometimes known as your afferent neurons with an A. Your motor neurons are also known as your efferent neurons with an E. So you can sense or be affected and you can then move or affect a change. Motor neurons are gonna take information from your central nervous system and get your body to react, to move. Sensory neurons are gonna take information from the outside world and send it to your brain so you can understand or interpret. Information will always eventually get to the brain for final processing. But here's kind of a way to think of your reflex. Let's say you're baking cookies. You know at your age that you shouldn't touch a hot surface. But let's say you're walking in the kitchen and someone is about to knock over the cookie sheet and you just instinctually reach out and grab the cookie sheet, which is very, very hot. That heat from your fingertips is going to travel very quickly up a sensory nerve and it will reach your spinal column before it will reach your brain. 
an interneuron in your spinal column will sit there and say, it's way too dangerous for you to maintain contact with this hot pan, you could do serious nerve damage. Now it's not gonna say this, but it's gonna understand the importance of the message it's receiving. It is then going to generate a new neural impulse that will travel down a motor neuron. And that motor neuron will cause you to release your grasp on that hot pan. It might be a fraction of a second later that you say something like, ow, or you actually recognize how hot the pan was. Sometimes it's more important for us to react before our brain can truly fully perceive what just happened. So here again, why we may pull our hand away from a hot surface before we really truly feel the pain. What you're seeing right here, this neural chain is simply the reaction that you would have. Your skin receptors detect heat over a flame. It's gonna send the information up a sensory nerve. The sensory nerve is going to go to your spinal column. It's not gonna to go to your brain first. The interneuron in your spinal column is gonna say, whoa, this can be really damaging. It's gonna send a new impulse down your motor neurons that's going to cause the muscles in your finger to contract and pull away from the flame. However, those interneurons at the exact same time are also gonna shoot information up to the brain. It's just that you may pull your finger away before your brain has the time to completely process the entire message, which is why sometimes those messages feel a little delayed. So we've talked a lot about your central nervous system, your brain and your spinal cord, what runs right down the center of your body. We've also talked about the motor and the sensory nerves that run in your peripheral nervous system. It's important to note that the peripheral nervous system actually has subdivisions. There is the autonomic and the somatic divisions of the peripheral nervous system. Your autonomic is also known as your fight or flight response. And that subdivides into something called your sympathetic response and your parasympathetic response. The most important thing to remember about the autonomic is that this is when you have your increase in heart rate. This is when you have pupil dilation. This is when you have your big freak out moment. It gets you very, very high into the fight or flight response and then can bring you back down. Your somatic is what we just talked about for that reflex system. This is going to be your motor and your sensory nerves and how it allows us to react in a reflex. So we've talked really pretty extensively about the nerves in the brain and the spinal cord and we've talked about the somatic. So now we're gonna talk about the autonomic. The autonomic, I always tell people, is automatic. The best way to talk about this is to put yourself into a memory of a time that you had a near miss or a freak out. So if you've ever hit something with a car or while practicing driving almost hit something, you know what I'm talking about. Even sometimes if you're in the passenger and someone has to hit the brakes really hard, all of a sudden you feel yourself panicked, you feel your respiration go through the roof, you feel your blood pressure kind of just pumping away and you are ready to fight or flee. That is gonna be you sympathizing with the scenario that you're in. It's your sympathetic response. Your parasympathetic response is what happens afterwards when you're calming back down. So I tell people to remember parasympathetic like a parachute. It slows you back down to your baseline, to your normal calm state. Your sympathetic is what allows you to understand the environment and why the environment should be scary. So I don't mean sympathize in as you feel sad for somebody. I mean sympathetic as in you see a lion charging someone and you go, I know how they would feel, terrified. Sympathetic is your fight or flight response. It prepares you to deal with life-threatening challenges. Now, there's a bit of a problem with this system in us. We will take a lot of things on as life-threatening challenges that are not life-threatening. So often we can have a sympathetic response to a math test. We can have a sympathetic response to a first date. We can go into fight or flight when maybe it doesn't really need or necessitate this fight or flight response. Your parasympath or parasympathetic division is what's meant to calm or slow you back down. This is what's going on in your body when you're going into fight or flight and then later when you're calming back down. On a very automatic level, your pupils will dilate. In fact, you're gonna take in as much light as possible. Your heartbeat is gonna accelerate. 
your body is going to push blood through your system as quickly as possible, trying to get oxygen and glucose or sugar energy to all of your muscles. Your stomach is going to stop digesting because it's not going to do anything to keep you alive and it's diverting energy from your legs, your arms, from whatever it is that's going to keep you alive. Your liver is going to start pumping out glucose, which essentially is sugar energy. Your adrenal gland is going to start pumping out adrenaline. Now here, it's important to note that your adrenal glands are part of a different system. They're part of your endocrine system. But what you're going to find is that norepinephrine is actually a neurochemical, and so the brain will start pumping that out, and it'll activate a structure in the brain that will tell your endocrine system to start pumping out norepinephrine. And your kidney, strangely enough, will relax your bladder because again, if you're really in a fight or flight response, if you're really about to die, you're not gonna reserve that energy to keep a muscle contracted when that energy could go somewhere else. Parasympathetic, once the threat has passed, your eyes will go back to normal. Your heart will slow down. You'll start to digest food again. You're going to stimulate the gallbladder and try to remove some of that excess glucose that might still be in the system and your bladder will contract. Now this is an extreme response. Most of you probably didn't wet yourselves when you almost crashed your car, but you probably had the shakes, you probably felt your heart racing, and that would be due to extra adrenaline in your system and all of that blood trying to pump glucose and oxygen throughout your body. You may have increased your respiration rate. So I mentioned the endocrine system. The endocrine system is your hormonal system. It's a slower messenger system in the body and it lasts a little bit longer because it circulates through the bloodstream. It is controlled by a gland and the only gland that exists in the brain called the pituitary gland. Because it's in your brain, we often call the pituitary gland the master gland. This gland produces growth hormone, which allows you to literally grow and it controls the release of hormones from other endocrine glands. It's located at the base of a structure in the brain known as the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus basically governs or dictates what the pituitary gland does. Like I told you before, it can inhibit or stimulate other endocrine glands. It's the master gland. Hormones are going to be the messengers in the endocrine system. The messengers in the neural system are neurotransmitters. They're chemicals, but they're different. Neurotransmitters travel in microseconds. It's the speed of light in a sense. Hormones take longer. So when you have a hormonal message, it's not instantaneous. It has to circulate through your blood system for your body to react to it. We have different glands that we do talk about. Now, while I'm saying this, it's good to know that the thyroid gland regulates energy levels in the body. If you're feeling really lethargic and it's been going on for a long time, you might have a thyroid issue. But we're not going to spend a lot of time being really focused on the different glands. Hopefully you guys have heard of adrenaline, so your adrenal glands. In times of stress, it's going to pump out that hormone and it should help you deal with fight or flight. Usually it makes you feel like you're a little bit stronger than you are, a little bit faster than you are. It gets you hyped up. Sex glands like your ovaries and testes will release things like estrogen and testosterone. So we know that those are going to be two different hormones that run throughout our bodies. And it is important to note that women do have testosterone and men have small amounts of estrogen. It has to do with the fact that essentially in biology we all come from mothers and we've all had some exposure to both of those hormones. This is where we're going to kind of end. So here you have a visual representation of all of the different glands of your endocrine system. I will tell you right now, the ones that you want to be most familiar with are the pituitary gland and the adrenal gland. You should know that the hypothalamus is the area that actually controls the pituitary gland, but we'll talk far more about the hypothalamus when we talk about the brain.